pick up what they cook. So good work, guys. Thank you. Excellent lunch. <laughs> drones. I love drones. They're just so cool. Uh, so we're gonna look at we're gonna look at Doing it. I, I have, standing here, I have a terrible echo. Do you hear the echo? Uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yes, no, some. Yes, yes, yes. Are most of you out there who like you can't hear anything? I think it's because the way this building is built. Okay. <clears throat> well, it gets weird. It's weird. It's weird. It's weird. Okay, drums. You learn to read drums. When you're looking, when you're looking at these landing on the landing board, when you're looking at these hanging out on the landing board, uh, what they're doing inside the colony, uh, time of day, are they flying, are they doing orientation flights, are they heading for drone congregation areas, are they in the, in the flyway between the high? There's a lot of things that what drones are doing can tell you about what's going on in your colony without ever having to open it up. And that's one of the reasons I like them a lot, is because they're just full of information. And, and they're, they're, they're Function in a colony is, like it says there, their status indicators, the health of the colony, how much food do they have, what's the queen doing, their gene transfer mechanism, because they are the sole descendant of the queen without a father, the drone is identical and genetically to, to the queen, so their job is to take the queen's genes and give them to the next generation in another colony. In the, in the late fall and early spring, and drones do over winter, uh, they're a heat sink. Even in the summer, they're a heat sink. They're big and they're furry and their bodies hold, hold heat a lot. So they keep healthy feet and they're cute. You can't deny it. Drones are cute. So um, here's a trip. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, anybody here ever go to school, take these to school? Yeah. If you want to try this, it's way cool. Go out and get four or five or six or ten drones. And, and just keep them in the jar, and put them in the take them in the house and put them in the refrigerator for about 10 minutes. Until they slow down. Not until they stop walking, until they slow down. You put them in there too long, they get cold chills, they'll die. You don't have to freeze them, they'll die. Drones dry, die at the drop of a hat. But once they slow down and stop being, being agitated, take them out and have ready with this sewing thread. And have a loop in it, big enough that you can slip it over the back of their abdomen and put it just kind of tight around on the, on the between your abdomen and their thorax where it gets narrow in there. And, and then let them go. Warm up, warm your hand on, warm up, and then let them go. And you can... Uh, <laughs> all right. We definitely should do that. And, and some of them will have gotten too cold and they'll just go for them. But you have got well, you can five or six of them. But try it so that it's... And then it, when you're in a school room for a kid, you just like this, you know. <laughs> Take him home and be nice to him. <laughs> it's really, it's really pretty good. If, if you like to go with kids, it's a neat thing to be able to do. Yeah, it's kind of hard on the drones, but... Um, <laughs> and the longer you make it, you know, at least six feet, but the longer you make it, the, the more they... And, 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 have you ever heard, heard a drone fly in a house? You can't believe how loud they are. And so you put them in a classroom and it sounds like Boeing 707 taking off. They're just so loud and the kids are playing. Something to do when you've got something better to do. Um, quick talk about the biology of drones. And actually, workers and police says you can get a feel for the difference because there's, in some ways, significant differences. Quickly go over the biology. Uh, and if you've got a mechanical drone, you don't have to go to the biology, you just engineering of it. Three days of egg, six and a half days of larva, 14 and a half days of pupa, 24 days of developmental time total. They come from unfertilized eggs, so the queen releases an egg, she doesn't release sperm to, to make with that egg, so the, the, the drone comes out, if you remember your high school genetics, the drone comes out N instead of 2N, and his genes are identical to his mother. He has a grandfather, he has no father. And that's what makes him different and special. Um, after, he's, after he emerges, uh, 
from a is Cuba, Cuba, three to five, five to ten days old. Uh, he's old enough to fly, and he'll start doing a few orientation flights, and his orientation flights get longer and longer and longer, and pretty soon he's ready to leave and go find a drone congregation area. And how do drones from this generation, this season, find the same drone congregation areas that the drones last year and the last season find the same? How do they do that? Because the drones in your, your colony are running the same drone congregation areas as the drones from your colony last summer went to. Ask the woman for directions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ask the woman for directions. You're probably right. <laughs> if you ever looked at drone congregation areas, has anybody ever gone looking for one? You need to do this sometime. You need to, you need to have to put your meetings and you say, we're going to go look for drone congregation areas. And you know what you need? All you need to do is go to a party store and get four or five of those helium-filled balloons that are shaped like cloth or something. And, and you bring in, you bring in, and you need about probably 50 to 60 feet of uh, kind of stout cord. And, and you tie that, the balloons to the cord, and then you suspend from the balloons in a cage, some sort of wire cage, either a virgin queen or some of the mating, st mating stuff that you can get that people use to attract swarms. But a virgin queen is what you need. It's hard on a virgin queen. <clears throat> but you can, you've got to start calling it swarming. You're going to have 500 you know, queens anyway. So. so put her in that cage and then start walking. And, and what you're looking for is you're looking for I'm going to generalize here a lot, but you're looking for an open field that's got a slope going up one side, usually covered with trees, and it may be completely surrounded, but there's an open field and there's a slope, and that slope is usually from the windward side, wherever your windward side is. I'm going to guess it's coming from east to west. Am I close? Anyway, that's what you're looking for, and it usually is fairly large. Not huge, but fairly large. <coughs> The first drone congregation area I found, I didn't have a balloon. I was in Georgia with Keith Elfman and Jennifer Berry, and we were going from someplace from Athens to down to uh, Bridgewell Banks place in southern Georgia. And we stopped late afternoon, and we were at, stopped at a Hardee's just for a, we grab a sandwich, and I opened the door, and you know, you kind of look out, and there's like five dead drones laying there. And you know, beekeepers notice that, nobody else would notice that, but a beekeeper noticed that you take a look around and there's, there's all these dead drones. And, and that Hardy's parking lot was a drone congregation area. <laughs> Believe it or not. And, and we, we didn't see any of the flying bees or the comets. I think we got there too late. But you could tell there were drones in this parking lot. So, you're going to find it by accident, but if you're trolling along with a Virgin Queen, you and there are drones out there, and you want to do it at the right time of day, you want to go out there not before 10 and not after 5, but that's the kind of day you want to go out there, and you want to be a not too windy day. But you will go out there, and, and two things may happen. You may find a flyway, and if you're from your area to the drone congregation area, you find a flyway. If you, if you, if you catch it, you'll see the drones come up against that Virgin Queen trying to get uh, to her through that cage that you've got her in. But if you move over six feet, almost either way, they go away. They go back to their flyway. So if you're in a flyway, that's how you can tell. If you're going this way, if you suddenly see drones, you move six or eight feet over that way or that way, and the drones go away. The comet will disappear and keep going straight. But if you're in a drone congregation area, the drone will drag this all over the place. But, um, anyway, I got sidetracked here. Drones are a luxury in the colony. And, and we talked earlier this morning about how colonies get rid of, manage to save food. It's the first thing they get rid of is drone larvae and then drone pupa and then drone adults because they spent the least uh, amount of energy in drone larvae and a little bit more energy and, and so they're working their way up. But the, 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 the retirement program for drones is not very good. Um, if they're lucky, he says carefully, they die happy. <laughs> if they're not lucky, they just die. So, and you can see, 
when you're looking at the, 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 the physiology and, and the, the body shape and the eyes and all those things, the eyes are big and close to the, on, on the top of their head. Because when they're flying in a comet, the queen is up here, and they're down here, and they want to be able to see her to raise up. Her eyes are up on top of their head, and they're much larger than the worker, worker uh, eyes. Uh, and because they have a longer pupil eye, Varroa mites like them a lot. Because on a regular, on a worker, a Varroa mite female can raise 1.3, and on uh, a uh, uh, drone she can raise 1.7 to 2.2. Offspring, so she can double her output in terms of live offspring on the drone route compared to a larva. So, but what happened? What happened with? They suspect, and, and some people are sure of it. Some people are, 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 are think it might happen. But Varroa used to be on Ava Serena, which is the uh, eastern eastern honeybee, and they have a little bit shorter lifespan. So they only went to the Varroa because the Varroa were long enough for them to reproduce on. They never went to workers, which is why Varroa don't, like, don't uh, harm any serena honeybees very much because they don't want workers. Only drones. And then, you know, you kill all the drones while you kind of slow down the reproductive part of Apis serena's life, but you don't stop it. And, and if you don't stop, if you're not infecting Apis serena, workers there just make a honey and doing what they're supposed to be. There was a genetic change. One, one female Varroa someplace changed so that they could go to Apis mellifera workers. And they don't know when and they don't know where, but th there's apparently some genetic change, some, some spontaneous something that allowed them to go to Apis mellifera workers. And that's, that's why that's when the world for us who raised Apis mellifera changed when Varroa now can go on both workers and drones of our bees. It happened, it happened in, the, in the China, Indonesia part of the world, and they spread from there. And now we've got it. But <coughs> because, they're, because they're longer, uh, as a pupa, Varroa like, like uh, drones a little bit better than the workers. So back to workers, fertilized eggs, two days an egg, six days a larva, 12 days a pupa, 21 days development. That's that seven, that's that three week time that I keep, that three week window I keep mentioning. That's everything you think about when you think about what's going on in your colony, what's going to be in three weeks, and that's why. It's because that next generation of workers is coming out, and what's going to be there for them? What's, what's happening between now and then, and what's going to happen after that? I mean, every time you look at a colony, you say, okay, I see what I see today, but what's, what's it going to be three weeks from today? I'm looking at larva, I'm looking at seal brood, I'm looking at eggs, I'm looking at what are you going to be seeing three weeks from now and what do you need to be ready for? And that's this is why it's that 21 time. Uh, they have they have genes for one wrong father, each worker has one father, but each queen mates with lots of drones when she's out there. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that you want to, when you're buying trees, how many drones was she able to, to make with? And that's what your queen producer should be able to tell you. If he says, well, the hooks say 10 to 20, find another queen producer, because it should be a lot more than that. Uh, when a worker egg hatches and it begins to be fed, it's fed royal jelly for the first three days, so are drones fed royal jelly. And, and so our queens fed royal jelly, but after three days of the queens continue to be fed royal jelly, the workers get fed, um, how do I put it, uh, uh, C plus food. <laughs> it's that quality. The queens are getting A plus food, the workers are getting C plus food, and the, and the drones are getting B plus food. It's better than the worker, but not as good as the queen. And it's one of the reasons that they're larger and more robust than workers, but not as large and as robust as queens. Um, workers in the colony all have the same mother, but different fathers. And there are many, 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 many different cell families in the colony of workers. And, and that's the diversity that a colony needs. You've got experts at, at all the different tasks that need to be done. Uh, and the more, the more fathers you have, the more diverse the colony is, the more likely it is for survival. Uh, workers with the same fathers or sisters, the rest are half-sisters. And, and there is two things going on 
I'm getting away from the drones, but this thing with sisters and half sisters. And for a long time, it was believed that I was one of them, that, that given a choice, I, as a worker, am going to feed a, I'm going to choose and feed a queen replacement who's my sister before I do that with my half sister. I mean, a family, you know? You save your sister and the half sister, well, only if I don't have a choice. And it turns out that's not correct. It turns out that, that what, what people are seeing is that the queens that get chosen are from the genes of what appears to be the most successful subfamily in that colony. How many of them are there? And that, that it really strongly influences what queens are chosen. If you've got a subfamily in a colony that's got, that's got genes from father that is not only not only not only successful but very successful in maids where you've got more sperm with the queen that's often the, the, the worker that gets chosen to be queen next it, it isn't sister half sister it's a successful father um, mother mating that, that seems to work and that's kind of changed how people are looking at this um, how do you measure what's successful in a colony in terms of the subfamily? Is, is, is it the workers that are the best workers? Is it the workers that are the best guards? Is it the workers that are, you know, what's the, what's the factor that, that leading, the over, overwhelming leading cause of success in this colony? And that's what people are still kind of trying to figure out. But that's one of the things. Um, uh, sisters that are genetically similar and will have same great identity behavior, for instance, uh, is one thing that's passed down from mother to daughter. Sisters can differentiate sisters from half sisters. And here you can tell how old the slide is. The slide is about a year old, and I didn't get changed yet, so shame on me. But they will favor favorite sisters for feeding and other care activities, but not when choosing a queen. And now we're even beginning to look at are they going to favor sisters over half sisters uh, on feeding and all these other things. Suddenly the genetic mechanisms are playing a, a lesser role than the success mechanisms that seem to be in the colony. Queens fertilize eggs, three days an egg, five and a half days of larva. Uh, you can read the rest there. Produced by uh, the same queen as the workers, but different fathers. So, so all, of the, all of the workers in the colony are related to the queen, not only, not only as, as a, a daughter, but also as a half sister, perhaps. The difference between a queen and her worker sister sisters is nutrition and epigenetics. And how does epigenetics thing work? It's the same uh, with, with um, lots of lots of other animals is that it used to be, we used to think that queens got better food and they said they get eight plus food. And we used to think that that was the difference. That's the only reason that queens were more sexually uh, mature and able to do all the things that queens do that workers can't simply because of nutrition. And it turns out that's kind of true. But, but what you really have is those that food turns on certain genes within that queen's body. And it's the genes, once they're kicked out, then the genes start making the differences between queens and workers. The, the nutrition turned on the genes. So you can say it's nutrition, but it's really the genetics that's going on with that queen. The, the genes turn, or the food turn the genes on, and the genes make a difference for her to develop ovaries, and for her to develop the size, and for her to develop all the other things, the ability to uh, produce all of the queen pheromones that she produces. So, um, a little biology different from drones, and, and, and just kind of helps you get a feel for there really are a lot of differences between these. They all kind of look the same and have to say, but there really are a lot of differences between these. Uh, as adults, you can see drones are different. We mentioned the eyes, the eyes way up on top of the head. They're much larger than workers, and they're not quite as, uh, quite as large as um, queens. They can fly faster than queens, and, and they burn energy faster than queens. A drone, going to a drone congregation area will go in a day, on a typical day, a typical drone, and this is the word typical in parentheses here, but on a typical day, a drone will go to the, to the drone congregation area three or four or five times while, while because he flies faster and burns up energy, he has to go home and eat. And mm -hmm. the queen isn't flying quite as fast, and she can circle. 
And uh, I don't want to call it gliding, but she uses less energy to go do the same amount of flying that the drones. The drones are just really chugging. And they are going to go back home and get something to eat, stock up, and come back to the drone congregation area in that time between 10 and 4 or 5 or so. Where the queen will go out there maybe twice. She'll only have to come back and feed maybe once. A drone, you can see on the, on the left there, a drone is a bigger pupa, and as a result, her head, his head kind of sticks up, and you can tell drone groups from worker groups simply because of the, they call it bullet shape uh, coverings over that, over the, the pupa there. You can see the difference in the size of the pupa and, and the difference in the eyes of the workers on the top and the right there, and the workers on the, or the, the drones on the bottom. And there we go. We did this this morning, calculating eggs per day. How many eggs, drone eggs per day, is a queen laying? And when should she be laying them? And this is, again, another good way to evaluate your queen. Is she doing what she's supposed to be doing? When she's supposed to be doing it? And, and when do you want drones? You want drones the same time you want queens, during swarm season, whenever your swarm season is. So is she producing enough drone eggs to accommodate I've got a queen who's mating with 20 to 30 to 40 drones per day, or, or per mating, and I've got to have that many drones out of my drone congregation area to make sure all my queens are getting mated with, that, with enough drones. How many eggs should she be laying for all the drone producing colonies I've got on my, if I'm raising queens? And this is the numbers to do it. And when you talk to your queen producer, he better know what he's talking about and how to do this, or you can find yourself another queen producer. Because this is the stuff they're supposed to be doing. They've got to have enough drones up there to make with all these queens. And if they don't, then that queen's going to come up. And we just talked about the more diverse your colony is, the better you're able to survive. If there's only two drones out there rather than 200, your diversity goes down the toilet. So your queen producer should be doing this. And you should be asking this question when you're getting a queen. Is how many drone producing colonies out there and how many drones? How many drones? And you can figure this out. Um, what do they look like? Italian drones are, are just a nice, Italian drones are pretty. I mean, they're just gold, and they're just, they're just pretty. They're nice, uh, big and fuzzy, and, and pretty. Carnions, you can see a carnion queen drone and worker there. Drones are as black as the queens, and they are really easy not to tell apart. Um, <laughs> you can, you can see, if you've got a pure colony, or a nearly pure carnion colony, you'll see You'll see that queen 30 times, and 29 of them are drones uh, because they, they're, they're big and they're black. But they kind of look different here, but when they're moving, you know, they're hard to tell. And they're both the queens and the drones are shiny black. <coughs> you can see the Russian queen in the middle, and you can see the workers. The workers are Italian-like, certainly. But boy, I tell you, if you if you ever run Russians. Uh, None of the bees in the same colony look alike, let alone the colonies looking like each other. They're just all over the map because they're multi-hybrids. There's just more kinds of, uh, more kinds of uh, genetic lines in a Russian colony than you can imagine. And no colony will look alike. The bees in, the bees in this generation are going to be different than the bees in the next generation because they're mating with pure Russians, but pure Russians from another line. So the generations change within a colony and the colonies are different from each other. So there's no way to look at a Russian colony and go, oh yeah, that's Russian, I can tell. Yeah, ain't gonna happen. But you can tell by the behaviors. Where drones are produced in a colony, drones, workers do best as larva and pupa at about 93 degrees. And, and the inside of your colony is gonna be about 93 degrees all of the time, whether it's December or July. Drones, on the other hand, go about 91. And if they get up to 93, they're going to start having trouble. If they get down below 89, they're going to start having trouble. So they're about 89, so where are they going to be located in the colony? Right on the edge of the brood nest, where it's about 91, not 93 in the middle. So you can see that when, you, when you're looking at, I think I got a point. I thought I had a point here, never mind. You can see where they, you can see on the, on the uh, way down at the bottom, on that slide there, the worker group up on the top, down the bottom where it's a little bit cooler, on the edge, down the bottom over there, uh, on the edges of on the, on the top of our hive where it's 91. And that's where you're going to find them. That's where the queen's going to put the eggs, 
and, and that's where, you're gonna, if you're looking for drones, that's where they're going to be. Now, you can use that. I mentioned trapping drones for raw control. Raw above drones. They're not, you're not going to get all of the raw out of the colony by, by trapping raw up with drones, but you're going to get a lot of them out. And where are you going to, where are you going to find drones? You're going to find them on the edge. Where are you going to, if you're going to use then drone comb, a sheet of drone comb or an empty frame that the bees will, 12 to 14 percent of the bees in the colony are going to be drones. And, and your colony is going to raise them whether you want them to or not. And so if they're going to raise them anyway, give them a place to raise them. Give them an empty frame where she can drone comb so that when the queen comes, she says, let's see, she, she puts her head down in the cell and she spreads her legs and she says, drone with. Okay, I can lay a drone egg here and she lays a drone egg here. Or if the workers are going, we don't have nearly enough space to put drone comb. We need more drone comb. They will build drone comb in an empty frame, like the one on the bottom right there. That's it. It was an empty frame. Now it's solid drone comb because the bees know that I need this percent of my bees need to be drone so I have enough diversity in the environment to make my colony survive and future colonies survive. So when you're putting in a sheet of drone comb or an empty frame, you're putting it on the edge of the brood nest, two and nine in a ten, in a ten frame colony. That's where you want it. You want it on the edge. And they will indeed build a whole bunch of drone comb. And the other thing you can do is you can put in uh, a, 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 a medium frame in a, deep, in a deep super. And they will put honey in the medium, and below the medium, they will draw a drone comb on the bottom. Hmm. And you can do it that way. Any way it works. The more you give them, the more they'll make, the more likely you are to trap more draw. So, <coughs> What you want to do then is, once you put that in, here's how. Here's how we trap drones, and we've had pretty good success in the trap draw with drones. We've had pretty good success with this. Uh, we don't get them all, but I don't have to treat hardly a for draw because I'm, I'm, we work at this a lot. I use a frame equipment. So my frames are, where I put my, my row of frames are, are, are two and seven, all right? So the first week I put out, I put out a frame in, in, in position two. A week later, I put out a frame in position seven. A week later, I put out a frame in the super above it in position seven, and then I wait a week. So that's four weeks. I come back in and all the drone comb in frame one is capped. Or as much as it's going to get capped, it's going to get capped. I take that frame up and I replace it with another one and I feed this one in my chickens. And they see me coming and they're right up against the fence. <laughs> the next week, same time, same day, I take out the one in, in position seven. The next week, and I replace it the next week, I pay, take out the one in position seven on the super above it. And we catch a lot of varroa doing that. The, the upside is, is that we kept a lot of varroa and I haven't put any poison in my colony. None, zero, zip. The downside is it becomes a religion. You don't miss that day. Because if you're out of town and that frame emerges, you've just released eight million varroa into your colony. Or maybe fewer, but that's, that's, that's the thing is you've got, it's a religion. Uh, we, I've had to treat probably once every three years when I grow up locusts. But this is what we do. And this is where my chickens get fat in their diet. Mm. Uh, and they do see us coming. When we, when we our, our bee yard's back here, our chicken poops up here, and we go back there, and we've got the, we've got the veil and the smoker going, and that's what they pick up on. <laughs> we're coming back in, they're, they're right on the fence, and we're like, supper's coming, come on, come on. So you can use this, it works. Don't put monocreen for mice because it might get ahead of you. Uh, and if it does, then you're assuming you're going to be disappointed. But you're certainly going to take a lot of raw out of, out of the hive by doing this. Now, the upside of that is a lot of raw gone. The downside is who's mainly the biggest queens? If you're, you just keep getting rid of raw and the queen goes, hey, she tried. <laughs> But there's not enough raw, and if you're doing it to all of your colonies, and your neighbor is, and your neighbor is, and your neighbor is, suddenly you don't have nearly enough 
drones in the environment to fill up that drone congregation area. So there's a downside to not having enough drones also. And I don't have an answer for that because I don't raise queens. And neither do any of my neighbors. But if you did, this would be a problem for that. Uh, and you can use exactly the same techniques to produce drones in the drone source colony as you do for producing drones in a drone traffic colony. And, and if, you're, if you're a queen producer, excuse me, isn't doing this, then ask him why. Why are you producing? Are you only letting your colonies produce the drones that they want as opposed to you super, super adding to the population enough drones of the known genetics that you want? That drone, the drones in that colony are all from the queens that I want. Every one of them, because they only have genes from the queen. They're not, they're not a hybrid or something else. So when I've got a queen, a queen that's got hygienic behavior, is resistant to varroa and lives 11 years, I want the drones from that queen to be mating with my future queens. And that, that way I'm raising the drones from that queen because it's only one, one gene line, not two. So I can, I, can, I can really, really, really start picking out what genetic lines I want going on. I know the queens that are going out there, and I know the drones that are going out because I'm super populating both uh, with what's going on. <coughs> Life is a drone? Well, it's not too bad. Um, once they're born, they spend, depending on the weather, a week or so, uh, kind of just being fed. You know, life isn't bad. I mean, just being fed, if it's nice, I'll go outside. If it's not, I'm going to stay here. You're just going to feed me, and thank you. And once they, once they get past that stage and they are, their muscles are mature enough and they're able to fly, they do, they do uh, you know, the, length, the learning flights, they go up and a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. And after about maybe anywhere from, depending on, depending on the weather and depending on um, the, needs of the colony, anywhere from a week and a half to two weeks, they'll start going, finding drone congregation areas. And they'll do that until they, there are more queens, or they get lucky and find a queen, and that's the end of them, or it's the end of the season, whichever. And some drones will live all summer long. They will they'll live the life of Riley until it's time to go mate, and if they're not fast enough or smart enough, and they don't catch a queen, they'll just live all summer long until they get kicked out in the fall. And I'm thinking it might not be a bad way to go, you know? <laughs> but there are things that aren't good for drones. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, mostly every chemical we use to control varroa is not good for drones, pure and simple. Uh, every one of them affects either sperm count or ability to fly or memory. And, and all three of them are detrimental to getting the genes you want into the population that you want. So if you're raising drones for uh, mating and you want to make sure that that, uh, that drone line continues, you're going to have to figure out some way to keep chemicals out of your, out of your, out of your hive because you're, you're hurting drones. All, everything you do is hurting drones this way. They are big and robust and fragile as heck. Uh, they're really susceptible to a lot of the chemical intrusions that we do. So, uh, if you are if you are using chemicals, you use a chemical that isn't going to bother them. Now, organic acids are pretty good on them. Uh, don't bother them. They certainly don't affect the sperm production and don't affect their ability to fly or memorize. I don't know, and I don't know that anybody knows what it does to them just physically. But it, it appears the organic acids appear not to do much. Well, all of these other things are not good at all. <laughs> Uh, we did that in, in our Medina beekeepers 
one time. We were teaching people how to, how to mark queens, and we were using drums. And uh, one of the beginners went home, and she marked every drone in her colony, and then she marked a queen with the same paint. <laughs> uh, Oops. But uh, like checking drift, and, and you'll be surprised at how much drift you'll see in a colony, uh, of drum, or in a, in a line of colonies with drones. And, and, and <coughs> They're just fun to watch. This says that they're going to make with 20 plus drones of queen is, and, and that 20 plus is queen plus. It's, it, they would like to see 30 plus, and, and if they could get it more than 30, they'd be happy with that. The greater number of drones of queen is able to make with greater diversity in the colony. And 20 plus used to be the top number, and now they're seeing it's a lot more. Dave Harvey's done some of that work, and he's seen even much greater than 20. And the more they have, the better success the colonies have. And just because there's just so much greater diversity to choose from, what line, what line is the best able to handle this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem? And the greater, more choices you have, the better the colony is able to figure things out and to overcome those kinds of problems. That's not good. There's a button here that makes it go black. Okay, where is, this is my house, right where it says 7011. That's, that's exactly my house. And if I'm looking at, and this is if you're looking for your own congregation areas, use Google Earth. Find out where your queen main nukes are and pull back and start looking at where you're gonna, where you want to, where you think your own congregation areas are going to be. Because you're not going to see the ones that are two fields off the road. You're going to have to get back and do a top view of it and take a look. And what you're looking for again is that open spot, kind of a hill on the windward side, and, and, a, and probably a straight line from your mating, your mating, mating nukes to, and when I mean straight, I mean pretty much open. Not roads work, but pretty much open from your, your mating nukes to where a drone congregation area might be. And that drone congregation area may be from here to the, to the curtain from your colony. Sometimes they are. But often they're quite a distance away. So what you got to do, and that's what I did there. I took a look at where my, where my house was, and where's a, where's a drone congregation area likely to be. And what I figured is, let's see if we can do this. Right down at the bottom center, you see the beginnings of that field? Right here. Mm -hmm. Windward side, I had an open spot, I had a windward side, I had a road that led me there. And I figured, well, maybe. So I took my balloons over there, and sure enough, there's a, a DCA over there. And it's actually a little bit further than that map. It goes down maybe another 50 or 75 yards over that field, and then there's a, a kind of a slope. But that road got me there. And that's where the drones were going. Open spot, easy to get to, had all the right geographical features, and it was about far enough away. So you can do it. And once you find it, then you start looking at how many drones are up there. And if you do the, the Virgin Queen thing, you'll get a comment, and you should be able to find, you know, you should be able to see a comment that's easily 30 or 40 feet long, and it, 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 we're real close to the Queen, very, very dense. There should be that many drones out there. So if you're Raising queens. Uh, that's what you want to be able to do is find that BCA and then measure the drone population that's out there and take an estimate. And it's a, taking an estimate of how many drones are is tough. But once you've done it four or five times, some days you go out there and there's nobody. No queens and no drones, what's going on? And some days you go out there and you can't, you're ducking drones because of falling from the air. It's mating so fast. So, um, you can do it. Talking to Fred Rossman uh, several years ago, but this was like, you know, we were looking at, at numbers. 60,000 packages, an additional 20,000 queens are produced in Georgia. I mean, Georgia needs to produce about one and a quarter million drones every year. Now, I look at, you can take a look at how many drones are in one of those frames that we just looked at. How many of those frames of, of drones does Georgia have to raise every year to produce enough drones to make with those queens? And are they doing it? And here's another thing you can look at if you're buying queens and you want to talk to um, uh, your queen producer. 
is, okay, I'm buying my queen and it's the 1st of May. That means she made it about three or four weeks ago, I mean the 1st of April. What was the weather like in Georgia the 1st of April? And the Weather Channel will solve that for you. Mm -hmm. And you can go back and you can take a look and say, they had 11 days of rain in Georgia. What's the chances my queen got made as well? Slim and none. So you can, figuring out some of these things, backtrack and get an idea how well this queen is going to be made and how well she's going to be performed, perhaps how many drones she was even able to make with, because if it's raining, they don't turn. <coughs> They just go all the way till tomorrow, lady. So all of these things can enter in. You get your queen in May and she doesn't she doesn't lay eggs or she's you know a drone layer or whatever. And and why? What did what went wrong? Well you go back three or four weeks and you look at eleven days of rain in Georgia and there was a problem. Or you look at the fact that not Fred Rossman, but one of these other people down there, eh, don't have any idea how many drone source colonies they got because they just said, well they just made. And some of them will say that. So if you find that queen producer who doesn't know or doesn't care or the weather's been bad, uh, maybe think twice about it. Uh, drones die happy, there's no doubt about it. And, and when, when a drone in a drone comet is able to catch a queen from behind, she, he is able to grasp her with his front legs and then you, know, you can see how it works and you can see the organ that goes inside of the Queen. Once that goes inside of the queen, essentially it explodes, it separates like this, like this, and it detaches it itself from the drone, and that kills the drone. He falls back, falls to the ground, and shortly thereafter dies. The queen has it still remaining in her as she's flying. The next drone to catch her will remove it midair, or she will go back to the colony, and the bees in the colony will remove it. And she's made it, not completely made it, because she's never made it with a whole lot of drones, but at least she will have some in there. And that, if you've ever seen a queen, ever seen a queen come back from a mating flight? Yep. Take a look, you'll see the mating, it was called mating sign. Usually uh, at the end, at the tail end of her avenue. And the bees will remove it right then. And then she's been a, made it at least once, probably a lot more. But the, the drone is a one-way trip. Uh, out and down, guys with a smile. You know? <clears throat> so there's a lot more about drones. I said at the beginning there would be some you know and some you didn't know, but not all of it because we'd be here way too long. So I'm going to quit now on this. All right. <laughs>